Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Eden NAP webinar. My name is Igor Balaban. I'm from the Faculty of Organization and Informatics, University of Zagreb. I'm an Eden NAP uh, member, and today I will be the moderator of this session. As you could have seen from the announcement, the session is entitled, How Can We Transform E-Learning Practices Through Capacity Buildings? Uh, today we have um, four panelists that will present you, uh, I would say very nice examples from two different projects, but from different perspectives uh, to see how can we use the European Union funds, the capacity building projects in order to transfer the knowledge to the ones that need such knowledge. Uh, thank you very much for your messages in the chat window. It's really nice to see that you are from all over the world interested in this topic. Uh, allow me just a minute or two to very briefly present the uh, panelists today. Uh, the first, the first uh, panelist we are going to hear today will be Dr. James Brunton, who is from Dublin City University. Uh, James will actually present one example of a very interesting BUCA project. It's a capacity building project. And uh, three other speakers, um, Dr. Mohammed Sharif, then Dr. Uh, Nishan and Shimna Shakib, who are from Maldives National University. They will present Ahmed project, which is also another capacity building project, and they will reflect from the institutional point of view, uh, from the point of view of people involved in the project, and then from point of view of the teachers who are directly targeted with the project. However, more details will be said by those presenters. So first, I would like to leave the floor, give the floor to Dr. Brunton. Uh, James, I hope you are here with us, that you can hear us well. Uh, of course, um, you are free to ask questions. We have the question and answer window that can be used for that purpose. Uh, I encourage you to put your questions there because it's very easy then to manage the conversation afterwards. So thank you very much. James, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I, I think we have a lot of different time zones, so I'll say good morning, good good afternoon, good evening, depending on uh, depending on where you are. Um, let me just share. Are you looking at you're looking at a slide with Buka on it there? So I'm just going to give you a brief uh, overview of uh, a, a very interesting capacity building uh, Erasmus Plus funded project, the the Buka uh, project. Um, Again, just to, just to do as I was told there to introduce myself a little bit. I'm a, an assistant professor in Dublin City University or DCU, as we just tend to call it. Um, I'm the, the chair of an online open education uh, undergraduate psychology program. I've been working on online and open education programs uh, in the university for 12 years um, my background is in psychology, but, you know, this work over the last 12 years has meant that I'm as much, uh, I'm as much, a, when I think of my discipline now, I think of open education, online education, as much as I think about my psychology. Um, so I, I've really, I've, I've melded those worlds and, and also all the research that I do tends to be very applied um, and tends to all be about my teaching and learning. So I'm, I'm one of those teaching and learning, open education, online education people. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk about the, the, the Buka project, you know, and this is a project that it very much speaks to what is possible in terms of capacity building, in terms of working with international partners to build capacity in higher education in order to have uh, societal impact in line with UN sustainability goals on, on quality education. The, the aim of this project is to promote equity and access to higher education in Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines through the use of things like inclusive learning design, learning analytics in online and blended learning, especially 
in the context of, of open and distance learning. And uh, sort of to do that, a lot of the work that's happening is about capacity building or putting the infrastructure in place in order to be able to engage in capacity building of staff. Um, in the, the purpose of the project is to help enable uh, access to higher education for people in rural and remote regions, as well as those with diverse backgrounds, so mature students, uh, working students, first and family students, students with learning difficulties or particular conditions uh, or impairments. So the, the lead partner in the project is TAMP or the Tampere University of Applied Sciences uh, in Finland. And uh, TAMP, along with my own institution, DCU, uh, we are supporting six fantastic teams in six different higher education institutions in Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines as they each engage in their own substantial and important institutional uh, projects. So the model that, that we are taking in this project involves engaging in, in authentic uh, capacity building of teaching, technical and sort of instructional design staff in those institutions, although that varies a little bit by project. And we'll kind of look at that. Um, supporting the strengthening of infrastructure and learning environments in the partner institutions. And I mean, that's where the, the European funding is going in some instances. It's to actually, you know, monetarily support their tar very targeted uh, uh, development of their institutional infrastructure around, you know, and you, around and then insert project here. And we'll see that in a second. Um, and then, you know, if, one way of saying this is, you know, staff in TAMC and staff in DCU are supporting the progress of the various pilot inter uh, interventions in, in the partner institutions. But really, it's not it's not just us coming along and delivering training. We are doing some of that, but it's more about uh, uh, information sharing and networking and, and creating uh, sort of networks of support between the different institutions that, that we're all sharing knowledge. We're all sharing expertise. Um, so to look at uh, the um, projects in the two Malaysian uh, institutions, the Open Vert University of Malaysia and Wasan Open University, they are very strongly uh, targeted uh, as capacity building. Now, the open, like you would think these, you, these institutions already have some experience in this space, but um, they are keen to ensure that their staff are sort of as up to date as they need to be. You know, like um, uh, some of these institutions have been around for a while and like, like the programs that, that uh, I've been working on for the last 12 years, maybe have a history in kind of traditional distance education modes. And, you know, at a point, maybe some of the things you're doing still relate back to this kind of traditional distance education mode. And that's just not where things are at right now. You know, there's some things are not going to be working optimally or, or you might see better practice somewhere else um, in terms of a more modern form of online learning. And you need to continually build up the capacity of staff in order to be able to keep up with that. So that's what the, the Malaysian institutions are very focused on. The Indonesian uh, projects, uh, are, are there's a little bit more of a uh, variety. So the in Universitas Terbuka, there's a really interesting project where uh, they're supporting students in disadvantaged and remote regions where regular internet access is just not available. It's just there's no internet connection out there. So what they're doing is they're creating local internet hotspots in rural areas that can then allow people in that area to use that local hotspot to engage in online learning. So it's, it's a, a different form of online because they're not connected directly to the internet, but they have this local hotspot that like if the information is put in the local hotspot, then people can, can draw on that uh, in terms of online learning in that area. It's a very interesting uh, way of, of pushing online learning out into regions where internet connectivity doesn't exist. Um, and then uh, Universitas Nigiri Padang is another interesting example because they are specifically focused on building up their sort of central professional staff capacity, you know, setting up a, a, a setting up a kind of what is it? Setting up a, a a team that can then engage in the capacity building with academic staff in their institution. So again, it's it's about setting up that infrastructure, setting up that uh, creating a a, a, a a wellspring of expertise that then other people in the institution can can draw on. 
I've deleted a slide there somewhere. Um, sorry, the Philippines. Um, but the 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 two universities in the in the Philippines then are uh, I'll just go back to the slide that actually had their names on. Um, they are both uh, they, they their their projects are a combination of staff capacity building um, and um, building up infrastructure to deliver open distance learning in remote areas because there is a national push in the Philippines to create zonal centers to to sort of try and widen uh, participation in higher education by having different different centers all around the country so that they can sort of push. Um, widening access, the widening access agenda into rural and disadvantaged areas in the Philippines as well. But um, they are also, especially uh, Mindanao State University is really in that position where they are really trying to push into, um, you know, the sort of blended and online learning space. So they are, they are engaging more in the capacity building than maybe the university, the Philippines Open University. They're already in a pretty strong place with capacity, but but the university, the Philippines Open University, they're the ones really pushing the the zonals, the development of the zonal centers. Um, so just to just to finish off uh, the presentation, you know, uh, before yesterday when I I I give a presentation in person in a room the last sort of big in-person event that i had been to was the kickoff meeting for this project in in penang in february 2020 and this project had been uh designed with a lot of travel a lot of physical meetups in the project so that we could have you know so that we could manage the project so that we could engage in training and uh, you know obviously all that went out the window and it really speaks to uh how yeah the, the Mar, you know march Mar, what was it march 2020 they they sent us all home again so uh the project had to completely change to you know an online format and it kind of speaks to how our research development and innovation work has changed during the pandemic because all of our management of the 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 project went online our training had to go from being a planned to be in person to being synchronous uh, online or sharing resources and communicating asynchronously through a through an online learning platform. Um, uh, we had to extend the project a little bit, and that kind of that that uh, speaks to how everyone has needed a bit more flexibility and slack during the pandemic to actually get what we need to get done done. Um, and those partners that were really just starting to build up their capacity in this space were like everyone else who didn't have a ton of experience with online learning, they had to start doing it at the same time as they were learning it, you know, during the project. And, and that speaks to kind of the chaos and the, the, you know, people having to suddenly change how they were working very rapidly. Um, and even into the future, organizing future um, training events, you know, doing them in person will now be very challenging because a lot of organizations have changed the way they work. Their staff is now distributed. They're not all in a central location. So saying let's do training in one place not only would people have to travel to maybe give the training, but people from that institution might have to figure out how they get all their people into one space, you know, at the same time. So it, it, it you know, the way the project has worked over the last uh, two years really shows how the pandemic has changed the way we engage. We're still trying to accomplish the same goals, but we're doing it in very different ways. Thank you. Perfect, James. That was really, really nice. Uh, now I'm, asking audience if you would like to ask James something uh, more and know something more about his experience and the project's experience, please do use question and answers uh, chat box to put your questions. Maybe, uh, James, I think that we have all experienced issues um, caused by COVID, right? Uh, now, in your, in your terms, you've had a lot of organization involved as a key stakeholder, so the ones that actually needed the practice and, and, and the experience. You were required to, I would say, completely change the way you did things because of lockdowns. Are there any factors like key factors that you could identify that were actually the key ones that help you to bring this project to the ends 
Yeah, I mean, the project is still ongoing and, you know, will be going on for another year or two as um, the partners sort of roll out their projects. I mean, the some of the things were just the, the unprecedented elements of the of the pandemic were just the, the chaos that people were trying to work through. You know, people were trying to work in their homes. They were continue. you know, they, they were they were working in in ways that we were never expected to work, you know, but the, the, the facilitators were becoming uh, as absolutely targeted as we could. It was about asking the partners, you know, what is the, what are the training sessions? What are the workshops? What are the, what are, what is the information that you, you feel like you most need and then trying lining up the lining up the training on the resource sharing to specifically target that. Um, and whether we would have had it in the project as strongly in the past, we really uh, moved towards a kind of peer support network as well. So we kind of did it by country, you know, so we had some people from Tamkin DCU and then working with the, the teams from the different countries and we formed little subgroups to try to continually support each other. So it was about, you know, it, I think it was about trying to be as targeted as possible when things were, as, were, were so chaotic. And the other one was like, you know, I, it was seeking seeking an extension. You know, acknowledging that that things were different, things were more difficult, things were going to take more time to accomplish, and to sort of formally look for an extension of the project. You know, uh, really uh, helped with that rather than sort of just trying to continue pushing through when that might not have been appropriate in terms of like the the well being and the productivity of all the project partners involved. Mm -hmm. Because in such projects, capacity building projects, especially those that are dealing with e-learning, right? We have uh, uh, we have experienced the um, emerging uh, emergency remote teaching, right? Which actually, well, for some institutions to start using the tools and the methods that they have not been using at the beginning, uh, at the phase at which at which we wrote the proposal, right? And in the beginning, we said, okay, the institutions do not have this and that, and then we will give them this and that. But now during a pandemic and everything, the universities were actually forced to change their current teaching and learning practice much, uh, much uh, faster than they would do in the normal conditions, right? So probably there, as you, as you said, there have been a, a large number of different factors that have involved in the projects and that have changed actually the current context. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, the, the current context is very, is, is very muddled at the moment because, you know, when, it, when, if someone comes along, like I'm, I'm an editor for a journal and I review papers for journals, and I'm seeing a lot of papers at the moment, which are very, you know, it's important for us to capture what happened during the pandemic to capture perceptions and, and, and everything. But at the moment I'm seeing a lot of papers where it's kind of, okay, we're going to talk about online learning and you're, you get into the paper and you're like, I don't know what I'm reading about anymore because the same terms are being used to describe pre-pandemic planned online learning and then online learning, which happened overnight during the pandemic. And it's like, it, it, at a point, you don't know if someone's being asked, oh, this is what the students' perceptions were. It's like, I don't know anymore. Was that based on pre-pandemic experience of online learning or was it about the emergency, you know, the emergency stuff that happened during the pandemic? So it, it it's a very, it, it, at the moment, we're waiting to untangle. Is this what online learning means now? You know, uh, am I just stuck in my pre-pandemic definition, you know, uh, or will things start to become more planned now? And how, it, how, if and how things become more planned in terms of online learning will then determine how we go forward, what the impact will be on staff and students and, and, uh, and everything like that. Good. Uh, we have one question and um, it, will, it is actually for all speakers. You can see it in the question and answer uh, box. Vlad posted the question actually for all speakers, so <laughs> the other speakers can prepare up front. Uh, what are the biggest challenges in capacity building projects? What solutions did you identify to overcome overcome them? Well, uh, for staff, uh, it's workload, it's time and resources. Um, you know, in, in, in higher education has a 20 year history of, you know, staff kind of well-being and, and mental health and things deteriorating. And, uh, you know, institutions need to take a more explicit uh, approach to supporting staff well-being. And, you know, that there's just academic culture and academic institutional workload models 
they're not they, they, they're not how you would design something if you were trying to facilitate people continually improving and things. Um, there's there's too much work in the in the workload models. And if 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 that if that was addressed in any way, that would allow a lot of what institutions say they want to happen. At the moment, you know, it's like, oh, please develop your digital competencies. But some staff will be interested in that and some staff will feel like they just do not have the capacity to engage with those, those requests at all. Um, and for, for students, it's the digital divide. It's, it's about, again, it's about dig- building up their um, capacity building and, and things like that. The, and, and in, for, at an institutional level, it's about having a clear strategy and then actually have putting the resources and the time into allowing that to happen and not just saying, right, make it happen, everybody. Good, good. Thank you, James. I, I think that this is this is actually perfectly in line with what the other speakers will also say because I think that from Ahmed prof, uh, perspective, perspective from the other uh, speakers, uh, that institutional commitment to make changes is what is crucial actually in, in, in this in this capacity building projects. Good. Uh, thank you very much, James, for this very inspiring presentation. Uh, now we have seen the project that actually targeted a variety of educational institutions as a key stakeholders, currently piloting the procedure. Now, the other project that will be presented is Ahmed project. This is a project uh, which aim uh, to build capacity only for one institution, one main beneficiary. This is Maldives National University, but it was focused on complete change. So the change that actually start from the, from the beginning, from scratch, and to transform the complete institution in terms of um, approaching e-learning. Um, with that sense, or within the Ahmed project, we have three speakers, as I've already announced, uh, Dr. Sharif, Dr. Nishan, and um, uh, my colleague, uh, Shivna Shakib, uh, who will present the project from different perspective, who will showcase how they approach the project and reflect, as I've also already mentioned, uh, from different um, uh, target groups. First, I would like to ask Dr. Sharif uh, to reflect on the Ahmed project from strategical point of view, from the point of view of MNU management. Dr. Sharif, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Igor. Um, let me share my screen first. Thank you again. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sharif. I joined the university uh, in 2015. Uh, I was here at the university briefly as deputy vice chancellor, re- research and uh, development. And then uh, later I joined as the vice chancellor. Um, so. I'm heading the university at the moment. Um, my background, I'm an engineer by training. Um, my specialty is in coastal engineering, but the, today I'm going to talk about e-learning and the developments of e-learning at the university. Um, I, I hope you can see my screen and hear me clearly. Um, in this uh, presentation today, I'll begin with an overview of the university and then highlight some of the significant milestones uh, the Maldives higher education, in the Maldives higher education context, focus, focusing on why e-learning is uh, critical for higher education in the Maldives. And, uh, uh, and our future directions in this regard. Uh, with a focus on, on where MNU is headed uh, in this regard. The, uh, first, uh, the, about the Maldives National University, uh, is MNU is governed by MNU Act. It was formed in 2011 which establishes and defines the university's functions. MNU is the country's first university and it's a public university, but it was, it has a history uh, in 
it was established in seven, 1973 as a training institute. And then uh, at that, in 1998, uh, several colleges which were, which institutes which were run under ministries were put together as College of Higher Education and then later to the, as a university. With, the, with this legacy of uh, higher education, MNU is the country's premier institution of higher education, um, graduating up to now by around 73,000 uh, students. All of MNU's activities are founded on our world view of philosophy and knowledge, reality and existence, which we call Iman and Ilm, those two words are Arabic words. Um, the Maldives National University vision is that the Maldives National University will perform and be recognized as the outstanding academic institution of the nation. Uh, our strategic goals, uh, we have 10 different goals. Out of these five of the goals, we, uh, is a, we can, uh, I would say that this project helps to get uh, del delivered. This is uh, all the, our operation plan is also uh, focus, focused on these uh, strategic goals. And uh, we very much focused on um, e-learning uh, to get the academic excellence uh, enhancing for, to getting the quality people and also fostering a conducive working environment and so on. While uh, going forward uh, with these goals, we have to also acknowledge the context of the Maldives and its physical and cut cultural uh, features. The unique geography of the Maldives is quite significant in this context. As you can see, um, our small population that is dispersed uh, across, the, uh, across the archipelago from north uh, to south, uh, we have 200 inhabited islands out of the 1,200 islands. Here in the photo on the left, uh, you can see how our country looks like. These are low-lying islands exposed to environmental changes and traveling to and from these islands and access to the resources varies across the islands. In addition, our country has a limited natural resource reflecting on an economy that classified the country as a low to middle uh, income country. But on the positive side, Maldives is a middle income country. In the Maldives, uh, education has always been a significant priority, uh, but higher education was introduced in the country much later. So uh, higher education was often sought abroad, like people of my generation uh, went overseas to get uh, higher education. Now with the advent of higher education services in the country, the focus of higher education at national level is to meet the national development needs. For this reason, uh, currently we have the government is giving away uh, the first degrees free of tuition fees for students who are studying and uh, also have introduced a loan schemes for students who wants to go uh, abroad or who wants to pursue their higher education locally. Such uh, schemes being available in a country despite the economic challenges demonstrate the place we put on higher education in our country and forward-looking approach we have on it. Um, talking about the changes, trends in the delivery of higher education in the Maldives are let me uh, also go back to where we started uh, giving uh, 
starting like uh, on this e-learning pathway that we started around 97 uh, correct me if i'm wrong as shimnandam who will come back after uh, later in 97 i think the college of for distance learning was uh, established a uh, center for open learning was established um, and then 2007 um, at all they started uh, on e learning um, and uh, later for synchronous uh, delivery we, we did get the help of the dirago the, the telecom provider to have a polycom system later uh, a learning manage management system established and uh, with model was introduced uh, in the country similar milestones in higher education includes the establishment of training institutes uh, that is we had called uh, it hotel school which was which i said uh, earlier uh, as different institutes uh, was brought up under one umbrella um uh, more moldis qualification authority also uh, it was part of the university earlier and then later uh, established as a different authority these changes that took place in higher education sector in the moldis some quite slow some quite rapidly almost overnight in some cases is changing the higher education context and frontier in the moldis along this uh this sorry but along this uh, the demographics of our students their needs and the demands from higher education is changing most of them wants to work full time and gain a qualification in the shortest most accessible most remote method um, so like uh, students who are working at their resorts they prefer to stay in the resorts and get their education uh, while working so uh, more flexible model flexible modalities such, such as e learning is required now these uh, features of development of higher education have served the country to some extent with our limitations being a small island developing states however uh the common and key challenges is most it faces in higher education provision still remains like uh, we have very cent uh, like capital being the main focus and limited resources in the outer at all which also hinders uh, us achieving the sdgs uh, like sdg4 we had a uh, distance learning model in the past to address this but it was not efficient and was not meeting the demands of the labor market so an alternative modality in higher education provision becomes uh, very significant e learning uh, stands as a good uh, practice which can minimize uh, these issues and challenges uh, we face however this change requires investment in human and physical resources such as moving from what we have been doing to a different set of practices and mindsets from traditional classrooms to virtual classrooms physical environment to virtual learning environment from tra traditional pedagogies to e learning pedagogies physical infrastructure to online learning systems these are challenges at cultural political and technical level and the paradigm shift we have to make needs to address this and brings this, this change to the higher education frontier in the moldis this requires uh, support in developing resources establishing infrastructure learning from others through networking and the giants in this field is who we look up to and from whom we seek this support and as a partnership uh, but not in the borrowing their policies or practices as we need something that is suitable and respectful of our culture and traditions uh, to bring 
these changes uh, there are certain preparation and strategic planning that are needed at this point there are some positives regarding this aspect and also came about uh, regarding the changes to education during the covid pandemic i think uh, the emet project was very useful as i have been telling uh, everybody that the preparation we have to do is minimal um, because we have set of uh, guidelines already set up and also we had a policy draft at the time so it was uh, easier for us to roll out uh, the e learning environment to our students who were stuck in dialects the covid uh, situation was an eye opener for the world is demonstrating how e learning is critical in higher education and the flexibilities it would bring in the provision of higher education yet it's also made it clear how limited our skills infrastructure and higher education curricula are for e learning modalities thus uh, we need to take care of and strategic plans to ensure that these limitations are addressed as we move towards e learning in the higher education e learning in the context of moldis uh, again we need uh, policies uh, we need skilled people and developing infrastructure at uh, mnu we understand that e learning modalities are quite critical and one of the most significant uh, way to providing a sustainable qual quality higher education service to the country currently the university's strategic plan uh, 2020 to 2025 have several goals that we want to achieve regarding e learning pedagogies and academic staff competencies for such pedagogies it is quite critical uh, to us that we establish a mechanism at mnu that slowly brings in the existing strengths of the university as a traditional higher education provider and complement various e learning pedagogies pedagogies so as to have a unique and contextually relevant approach to e learning at mnu such a bespoke uh, approach that provides a road map then will bring the best of both worlds we are we are ready to face the new world firm in our roots of education while uh, ensuring our teaching and learning at mnu develops graduates who are competent to use technologies tools in their profession and be competent workers in their every evolving job market and this will also further uh, in their later life when they are doing uh, continued professional uh, trainings i think the we have to embrace uh, e learning and then move forward thank you very much that is my presentation um, if you have any questions i would be happy to answer thank you Thank you, Dr. Sharif. Actually, we have two questions in the question and answer session. I'm, I thank the audience for bringing those questions. Uh, okay, uh, since we are waiting for the other speaker, uh, Shimna, who is experiencing some issues with the electrical, with, with, oh. with, 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 with power, yeah. So she has been... Um, switched off and on over all over again but this is what the online <laughs> webinars do right uh so um i would then maybe uh, proceed with the questions for dr sharif so the first one um, was are the maldivian standards available somewhere um you mean the standards for our learning Uh, Brita, can you maybe uh, specify more your your question, elaborate in more details? 
And the other, the, maybe maybe once, uh, since we are waiting the elaboration for, 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 from Brita, maybe the other question. Did this project help uh, to implement concrete changes in the national le legislation and or strategy of the Maldives? Or is this planned for the near future? I, I think uh, this project uh, helped immensely with uh, e-learning, uh, provided uh, guided and structured programs for e-learning implementation at MNU. The support from the project was great, uh, critical in getting more staffs on board for e-learning. Um, it also developed capacity for a lot of our staff. Um, the, the training that we were provided at, the, uh, at Carnet, uh, at uh, FOI, and also at, in the bar, work in Barcelona, I think that also helped the project staff. And also the, uh, the visits by the project team from the European and, uh, partners also helped the, our staff. Uh, I think when my colleague uh, speaks later, I think she will uh, give some highlight on those uh, the, the experiences from the lecturer's perspective on this one. So I think I think that I will keep that short there. Um, if good, what are the things? There, there are more, more things I can talk about this project. Uh, that what helped us, but I think. For, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, and we have uh, yes, Brita. Brita contacted us again, and yes, she said that the uh, Maldivian standards that uh, she was referring to was uh, were in relation to e-learning standards referred into the presentation. Um, we don't have a national standard yet, but we have uh, at the university adopted our own. Um, ways of doing it, how, how, how things should be. And very shortly, I think the, the Maldives Qualification Authority is working on a guideline uh, and also a regulation on how uh, e-learning should be done. So th th that is coming up, I think, very, very shortly. And this will be available. Uh, the, the guideline is in English, so uh, it, it will be available on that soon. That is the national one. Good. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sharif. Since you are the panelist, you are all you have. Uh, you can also type in your answers in the question and answer box, and you can also decide whether you want to uh, answer some questions live at the later stage, or you just want to type in the answer so everything is allowed. But now I would like to uh, maybe move 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 forward to our next presenter. I'm sorry that. Shimna was disconnected. I really hope that she will be back with us again because um, uh, she will present the project, what the project is actually about. But maybe while waiting for Shimna, I would like to ask Dr. Nishan to reflect on the teacher's perspective because as I've already mentioned, the Ahmed project uh, targeted into transferring the teaching and learning practice at Maldives National University, not just by proposing a complete e-learning strategy or e-learning roadmap. One of the main aims of Ahmed projects was also to develop and implement a pilot study program consisting um, of two pathways. The first one was for, for decision makers and the second one was for lecturers in order to boost the skills of decision makers and lecturers at Maldives National University. So the main point was that lecturers and decision makers, makers go through that um, piloting, piloted study program and to get the certificates in the end and then to accredit that study program for future use for future uh, teachers and future decision makers. So uh, now I hope that Dr. Nishan can reflect what did the teachers, what have the teachers learned, what was their perspective on the project, 
and how they how they face the challenges not just by um, enrolling the study program but actually having the needs to implement the e-learning uh, in the in their courses so dr nishan please the floor is yours thank you Andrew. hi everyone uh, let me share my screen See the see the slides, right? Yes. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to give a small introduction about myself. Um, I'm a, uh, I started teaching uh, TJ, t my teaching profession uh, at um, Maldives National University, which was a college at first. I started my career at the age of 19, trained as an English language teacher. I have worked in the middle school teaching as an English language teacher, as well as later uh, gained a degree um, in language teaching and teacher training and worked in the, uh, as a leading teacher in one of the leading boys schools at that time. And after that, I received Australia Award Scholarship, um, did my Master of Education in Melbourne, RMIT University um, did a small, uh, it was based, basically my focus was on uh, educational leadership. I also did a minor uh, study on communication of change in organization, especially as a, in a school. And then later I worked in the Ministry of Education in the policy section uh, as an education development officer. Also worked as a deputy principal in an international school in the Maldives. And after uh, completing my PhD, I joined the Maldives National University in 2019. Even though before that, uh, I was a part-time lecturer at MNU as well as uh, some other higher education colleges in the Republic of Maldives. So I have gained uh, different levels of experience in teaching. And what I have to say about the MNU project is um, uh, when I joined the MNU project um, due to my interest in learning about e-learning, it was... Um, I had the understanding that we could all, as teachers, use uh, e-learning quite simply just uh, using the lessons and the uh, out subject uh, outlines and the lesson plans we had. But I was very wrong because when I uh, in, uh, enrolled in this project and uh, when I started with the first module, I got the understanding that e-learning also needs a different kind of plan, what we call a, like a blueprint for our lessons. Like, and then uh, the instruction design is, uh, need more structure and more focus and new concepts are coming into it. So one of the things um, uh, I really enjoyed doing with the other lecturers as well was, it was not only on content based, it was not about our trainers telling us, uh, these are the resources and uh, read through them and uh, do the, your activities and the online discussion forum, which was very, which I found very useful and very, very uh, knowledgeable. It was further more about practicality. Uh, one of the exercises of a tutor, uh, the trainer did was we took a, uh, one of our own subject outlines for one of the modules. And then we actually uh, com compared it and we listed out what are the, what are the uh, students, and whether it is students and what are the student uh, based learning in it and what are the outcomes. So we learned, uh, read about learner outcomes and how to structure it in a way, the lesson in a way that it is more, uh, more engaging and more, Pre pre well prepared for a delivery of as an e learner a e lesson. So uh, another thing I would like to say is the resources that were used during this project as our training were very rich. Especially, I was able to relate my experiences uh, in also in discussion with the other lecturers because the resources that were shared with us had case studies of e-learning in universities. So it was more uh, interesting for us to see, okay, how, how has other universities done that? What model did they use or what are the uh, structures they have used? So we were able to more relate it more uh, to 
our our own experiences so that we could understand this concept of e-learning. As Dr. Sharif has also mentioned that due to our geography, um, it is a bit of a challenge because students cannot physically come uh, to the uh, campuses and study and we offer our courses as, as um, blended learning and uh, distance learning. So this is very useful to us and especially as we started with this uh, the, the EMIT project, it was also coinciding with the uh, pandemic. So we were already uh, doing online teaching and uh, which, was some, which was quite new to some, uh, uh, some lecturers as well. Some of the skills we had to learn, like I didn't use Zoom before, so we have to learn how to use the Zoom uh, F and S as well as structure our lessons in a way to engage the students. Also, um, uh, as uh, James has mentioned, overall, uh, in honesty, as lecturers, we did find that uh, the content and the engagement of uh, the EMET project along to cope along with our teaching load was a bit challenging. So uh, the time constraint was there, but however, we, we were motivated by our tutors, our trainers, uh, they used to remind us and contact us and say, how are you doing with this project? Do you have completed up to this? Do you have any challenges? How do you need any support? And they were so supportive and encouraging and it was a motivation to actually complete all the tasks. So, uh, what I would like to say is even with the challenge of our workload and time, uh, we enjoyed being part of this project. And it was quite interesting because of the practicality of it, how we are uh, creating these uh, tasks that were very, very relevant to us. So basically, it gave us the, it, especially it gave me the co concept and understanding of what e-learning is about and how we need to actually structure our lesson in a way to get the maximum out of it. And uh, focusing on the, uh, the second thing, thing I would like to mention is about the instruction and design. It's like, uh, as I said before, in our uh, for example, I, I took a sample module, a subject that I was teaching, which was uh, edu research, educational research. So the research, the research was very, very focused on teacher-centered uh, because we were delivering more. And then uh, part of it was about students. So when we were starting to uh, understand uh, and read about the context uh, by the, with the resources and uh, doing the task, we learned how to embed the use of technology and gain, gain more flexibility in our lesson to bring out the mixed approaches. And uh, one of the interesting things I learned about was how to get the um, instructor is in control, uh, but there are so much resources that we use for the learners so that we need to, uh, we are, uh, providing them a platform of several resources that they can learn from. And the burden on the lecturer is less. It's more, um, it's, it becomes more or less and more easy once we have a very structured uh, lesson, e e e e structured lesson for e-learning. Uh, and by doing so, we are ta tailoring our strategies to differing learner needs of personal control and choice. And this is something I am focusing on because in schools in the Maldives, we are now training teachers and we are moving towards uh, inclusivity, how to, um, to address learner needs. And one of the things we need to focus in higher education is about uh, inclusive education. How are we uh, uh, addressing to learn our needs? And one of the important thing is by through this project, I have learned that using these di different resources and different activities using, uh, giving them the control over their learning and being a facilitator, the lecturer being a facilitator, it actually uh, is addressing their learner needs and increase in student engagement. One of the concerns of lecturers even now, even today is that when we are doing online lessons, uh, stu some students are not engaging well. So, and I'm also doing a research in two public universities as my data collection focus for student engagement in online learning. So this was very important and very useful for me. 
And uh, this is something I'm also working on. And I would, I think we would get a very interesting uh, finding promo. So the role of lecturers also uh, changed as we were also learning co-learners and contributors for the development of students. Another uh, invaluable thing I have learned about uh, and uh, we also discovered because we were working together during this uh, discussion forums, which was a very good platform to discuss and compare our ideas and what we have learned and uh, providing uh, uh, a very fruitful discussion about each concept. So the com uh, coming across these different models like competency-based model where the, it is, uh, the assessment is measurable and using the business model and the practical activity. Uh, as I said before, we, I, I selected one of my modules, which was educational research module, and then we used the business model and then we created the practical activity using uh, the tools that we have learned, the content we, were, uh, we, we, we learned and we shared with each other in a collaborative way and we created one lesson, one whole lesson for this. And this was very useful because we were able to apply the knowledge and the skills that was gained through this project. And according to the resources shared and the research, High, this, uh, by using this e-learning, there's high retention uh, and there's simplicity and it is very scalable. So this was an advantage for us lecturers. Before I finish off, as, as I can see, I'm um, reaching my time limit. Uh, one of the uh, amazing thing about this project was the networking and collaboration. Like I was collaborating with another le lecturer uh, working uh, with another faculty and we were able to uh, create this, generate these diverse discussions about as, as we were planning the activity. So getting this opportunity to work together with a colleague and uh, critically analyzing what we have done uh, was one of the uh, high points of this uh, project. Uh, the discussion forums, as I said, where, where we were able to uh, clarify our doubts as well, our inputs to the activities as well as the models and the design and the instructions we were using uh, is uh, uh, quite, was very uh, enjoyable. I really enjoyed that discussion forums. Uh, one of, and what did we have to take away from this point? Uh, at this point, by the, at this point of the project, all of our lecturers, we had an actual design of an actual lesson to take us take away with us. So we were applying our skills and knowledge um, in collaboration in by within the network of the lecturers, and this was very very uh, useful for us. Uh, although, as I said. It was a bit challenging with the workload and the time constraints, especially when we were already uh, uh, offering, we were already in teaching online and assessing and creating our own, our own activities uh, due, to, due to the pandemic. This became quite interesting for me and we were able to use some of the things we learned in our classes. So now it is more uh, engaging as I would say in my research um, lessons, I have used some of the things I have learned that uh, giving them resources and getting them to read and uh, read at their pace and uh, completing the online task and coming back to class and where we'll have the physical uh, interaction with it. So more flexibility has been gained and uh, more knowledge uh, about e-learning has been gained. And I think this is going to be very, very uh, useful uh, for all the lecturers uh, in the future. Um, th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishan. That was really nice to hear such wonderful experience um, as the, uh, from the teacher perspective. Now, I see my colleague Shimna is here, and I would suggest to move to her presentation. Shimna, maybe in 10 minutes, if you can reflect on the project before you, and we hope that you won't experience any more power cutoffs today. Um, Dr. Nishan, I would just um, uh, like to ask you to stop sharing your screen. How oh, good you did. So, uh, Shimna, you can you can take the floor now. Okay. I'm sorry um, I got disconnected because of the power cut we are experiencing. Oh, that's the disadvantage of technology. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, 
and good afternoon from Maldives. It's a very sunny day in the Maldives, as usual. I am <laughs> delighted and very excited uh, to be a part of this webinar. Uh, thank you so much for um, the invitation to contribute to today's topic, which is how can we transform e-learning practice through capacity development? I believe um, capacity building is a required commitment now more than ever because we are all moving online and it should be an important strategic goal at all levels, especially as higher education institutions uh, in the Maldives as, as around the world embrace innovation and new educational technology. So I am going to focus, my talk will be mainly based on EMED project and the capacity building activities and um, let me share this. Uh, Okay. Um, are the activities um, and the outcomes and its long-term impact on the Maldives National University. So this is a snapshot of the project. As you can see, it is called Advancing Higher Education in the Maldives through e-learning development. And the budget allocated is um, 720,592 euros, out of which um, the budget allocated for the Maldives National University is um, 363,984 euros, which is quite a, a large number in terms of funding. So the project is now almost complete. As you can see, we had a very um, relevant five work packages. The first one, which was need analysis and preparation phase, where we actually learned about the Maldives National University as an organization or an institution and where we were at that time at the beginning of the project. And we had uh, developed a study program and also in work package three, uh, we have developed an institutional framework for e-learning. And I think uh, this is the right time to talk about the project because we are almost at the end of it. Uh, in terms of capacity building, I would like to focus first on, on these three areas because um, mainly we have learned a lot of uh, other things, but I'll focus on these three because we don't have that much time. So I would like to look at how the project have uh, contributed towards developing the knowledge and skills of the relevant stakeholders from different levels of MNU. Um, in fact, uh, the project has um, helped engage decision makers, um, IT technicians, and teachers, lecturers who play, and, and I believe who will continue to play a major role in e-learning development in the Maldives National University. Uh, before the project, as the Vice Chancellor had uh, highlighted in his presentation, the um, we had limited facilities and limited number of people who I would describe as um, e-learning enthusiasts who were engaged and involved in promoting e-learning. However, because of the project, now we have um, so many people. We have uh, be able to engage almost 25%, nearly 25% of the relevant stakeholders of MNU in the e-learning dialogue. Um, I would say this is a big achievement. Um, through uh, the activities such as training, uh, job shadowing at um, University of Catalonia, Open University of Catalonia, and um, FOI, Faculty of Organization and Informatics from Croatia, and the pilot study program implementation uh, at MNU, we have been able to engage um, close to 120 people, um, including 20 decision makers, uh, more than 20 technical staff, and uh, more than 50 teachers. Um, I would say that job shadowing held in Spain and Croatia was especially helpful. It helped the MNU team uh, to connect with experts in the area of e-learning, observes the uh, systems established to support uh, e-learning and also to engage in dialogue related to good practice um, in the area of e-learning. So I think I would describe this as one of the most um, interesting, inspiring learning experience for all of us. Um, so this means in the last three years, starting from 2019 up until now, with the help of the project, MNU has experienced, I would say, an exponential growth in human capacity building um, in the area of e-learning. 
Um, I can confidently say that now we have more people like uh, Nishan who are more aware of e-learning practices and uh, they are more aware of what has to be done and also what are the challenges um, that we might come across when we are trying to implement quality e-learning at MNU. Uh, through this project, uh, we are indeed able to enhance people readiness, the readiness of the people for e-learning delivery. Um, the, second, uh, the second part I would like to highlight is uh, development in infrastructure. The project, um, um, has a the project fund has helped MNU to establish uh, several e-learning facilities in, across the campus, um, the four regional campuses and in the central campus. So before the project is, once again, the vice chancellor highlighted, we had a multi-purpose uh, polycom room where many uh, programs has, have been conducted and uh, it has helped bring different um, campus students studying in different campus together. So it was used as a multi-purpose room and we had all our classes uh, equipped with projectors and computer systems. So that was the status then. And also we had a learning management system. But um, with the use of, of the funds and the equipment provided through the project, we have been able to establish uh, these new facilities that will help um, advance e-learning in the Maldives National University, plus also uh, engage um, in delivering our service to others who might require it as well. I would like to highlight um, that um, with this, we were actually able to help um, several institutions during the pandemic time. For example, we had during the pandemic, uh, we had the election commission in conducting virtual training uh, for the election commission, uh, commission officials for the local uh, council elections in 2021. We also supported one of the faculties at MNU Faculty of Arts um, to conduct a hybrid course online for judicial administration um, services. So this means that uh, as the oldest and the largest higher education institution in the Maldives, MNU today, we are more ready uh, than the past uh, to respond to the needs of MNU staff, MNU students, and also other external stakeholders as a result of um, the infrastructure development funded by the project. So you can see some pictures of our studios. At the moment, we have these little spaces that we are using for different purpose. And this is um, something that we can use uh, for our course design and delivery as well. Um, this is the Polycom room, which we had been using before, but it has now been um, changed to the e-training room with the uh, equipment uh, funded by the project. So I think it has been uh, quite a um, good learning experience, not only for the people who are academics, but also the technicians who are and, uh, some, uh, some of them who has been trained through the project to facilitate these uh, spaces, e-learning spaces at MNU. So now we have, uh, um, I think, uh, build the institutional capacity in terms of digital infrastructure as well. And also through the sh job shadowing, we have had access to a lot of um, e-learning uh, rooms and studios. So we have um, gained knowledge about how to structure and how to establish them. So I think that will be quite beneficial for us in the future. Um, this is the, what you see on the uh, my left. Okay, the purple T-shirt is out from the picture from the workshops we had run for the local council, and on your some of the pictures showing the hybrid uh, course uh, delivery setup at MNU. So I would say, uh, as you can see, we are more um, more uh, developed in terms of uh, where we were in the past because of. Uh, the project. And uh, the third one I would like to highlight is the policy roadmap. I believe uh, if, when we are moving forward uh, with e-learning development, it is important to have policies and uh, that will guide us um, or actions that will guide us. So through this project, project um, 
uh, an e-learning roadmap has been uh, developed, which will be used in the next five years to drive uh, the actions of different faculties of MNU. It is based on the strategic goals of MNU, and it was done through a consultative process, so engaging uh, most of the uh, relevant stakeholders in developing this. So I believe even after the project um, um, ends, um, we can use this document to guide and um, develop our uh, e-learning practice. So it has been a, a very important document and it is at the moment it has been endorsed by uh, the university. That means it will be the lot of action, most of the actions specified in the roadmap will be realized within the next um, five years. Um, I have just very uh, briefly uh, looked at three key areas, but I would say that um, this three years has been a very important learning experience uh, for all, many people, including me. And I would like to summarize some of the key learnings we have actually uh, gained or in terms of capacity building, how we have uh, developed ourselves in this three-year journey with them and project. Um, we have um, at the moment uh, designed and piloted uh, an e-learning training course for decision makers and teachers. It is now available for future use. So that, that, that means um, a course developed uh, by experts, reviewed by experts will be available for or a menu and other external people who might need training in this uh, in the area of e-learning. We have more trained people at MNU at the moment uh, than when we started. And e-learning is always a challenge. Uh, we need to change mindsets. We need to change the philosophy of teaching and learning. So, but it's important to have that training and also people who can engage effectively in the e-learning dialogue. So I think that's, that has been a big achievement. And also we have the e-learning roadmap that will guide the university in reaching um, where it wants to be in terms of advancing e-learning at MNU. Uh, we have improved technology infrastructure as I have highlighted before. And um, through the three year uh, trainings, interactions, we have learned um, how to design uh, courses for effective quality uh, uh, learning, whether it is blended mode or even uh, when we design face-to-face -face classes, what are the good practices that we should adopt uh, in terms of course design? And um, it has also mainly helped IMENU to realize or to observe or to analyze its current status and identify the structures that needs to be established and the uh, uh, it has helped fill those gaps um, to some extent. Um, and it has also opened opportunities to build uh, very strong partnerships with experts, which I we will value. Uh, that collaboration has been a very valuable uh, collaboration because we have not only learned what has been specified in the project, we have also learned about um, how to work uh, uh, with a different group of people, how you know, and especially with experts. And the last one is um, we have gained a broader understanding of the university, and we know we realize where we are and where we want to be in the future. So these are this is a just quick summary of what we have learned. Um, as for what from what I have just discussed in a very uh, uh, summarized way, uh, it is evident that MNU has um, developed from where it was. And I would like to um, conclude uh, the presentation by stating that we appreciate the funding, the support, and um, the partnership that was provided through the project. And I believe uh, we need similar um, opportunities to further enhance the current status of e-learning at MNU. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And I hope in a very rushed way, I have covered a little bit of what was, uh, what was happening in the project and what the activities uh, that uh, were conducted and the impact of it. It's not the end of e uh, developing e-learning at a menu. It's just, I would say, the beginning. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Shimna. Thank you. Shimna. I apologize to the audience. Uh, this presentation, this presentation should have come earlier, but 
since the power cutoffs, <laughs> we, <laughs> we were not able actually to to say to tell the story uh, before. But now I think that the audience got the general impression about the project and from the presentation uh, of Dr. Sharif and uh, Dr. Nishan uh, to see also some experience and reflection of the people that were directly involved in the project as well. Um, good. Since uh, we have exceeded actually the time uh, for the webinar, I would just very shortly uh, switch to the last question we have in the uh, question and answer uh, box. I think I forwarded the question to Dr. Sharif as the question was pointed out while he was uh, giving his presentation. Dr. Sharif, were you able to read the question? I did. Uh, Shimna is going to answer for you. <laughs> What's the question? Sorry. Uh -huh. That's in, in your <laughs> inbox. Good. So, uh, talking about using e-learning. Yeah. yeah. Talking about using e-learning means as strategy, converting from lectures, traditional, now fast moving into e-learning segments all over the world. Best practices now, but now here, but what about the more future idea? Okay five years from now, can you comment on that? Um, we actually are a little bit behind in terms of how e-learning has been developing. So we, we are in the process of establishing, um, you know, strengthening our learning management system, establishing policies and training people. But in the future, I hope, especially in um, our faculty of education, uh, we will see opportunities for to include gaming, maybe um, AI, different AI, AI technologies, uh, or most importantly, using data analytics to um, support our students. That is something I would really like to see happening in the next five years, to, uh, because we want our students to be in a menu and we want to support them. So I would say um, in the next five years, it will be strengthening um, the quality of um, focus should be mainly on strengthening or enhancing the quality of assessments plus introducing the relevant technology that will enhance our um, design and delivery of um, e-learning at MNU. So I hope to see um, more use of gaming and uh, data analytics uh, used in the uh, university. Very good, very good. Uh, maybe with this, we can finish this session. Uh, maybe again, uh, First, I would like to thank for the uh, to the panelists and for the audience for being so patient for uh, triggering the lively discussion. Uh, you've seen two different capacity building projects, as already mentioned in the beginning. The first one that targeted uh, more than one institution and the second one that targeted only one institution but you see the but you have saw the seen the extensiveness of the project because the other project was not focused on one on on just one point but was focused on um, transferring the complete organization which um, which 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 involved the infrastructure the strategic documents um, courses, training programs, and which was, I would say, a quite extensive and very good experience for all interested parties. Uh, once again, thank you all. The webinar recordings will be available at a later stage as well. I wish you all a pleasant day and thank you very much once again for being with us. Thank Ciao. you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Hugo. Have a nice day. Bye.